Welcome to the Bible's Greatest Mysteries from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we're delighted to have another program with our good friend, Dr. Doug Petrovich. And we are digging into the Bible and finding out that the rocks really are telling us. They're screaming out. They're yes. screaming mm -hmm. out. You were telling us yesterday, and we're going to get to, to a question about the Hyksos in a minute, but when we were having dinner yesterday, you were talking about moments when the Lord showed you something, oh, yes. and it almost, it, you, in fact, you did weep sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, for me, Sharon, this is not just something academic. Um, my faith is tied to all of these events. And I'm amazed that for some reason in our time period, all of this God would bring to the forefront. He would bring to our attention for over 3,450 years. He's kept it from us. It's been historically. sealed. Historically, it's been sealed. And now he's uncovered it. And imagine when I'm sitting there in Toronto, uh, I'm supposed to be working on my dissertation at the <laughs> University of Toronto. There are a lot and of moments, My advisor will hate to hear this, I'm sure, if he ever hears Oops. this. Oops. Uh, but as I was stumbling into one gold mine after another, the identifying of Joseph and of Jacob and of Ephraim and of Manasseh, and that Hebrew is the language behind the oldest alphabet. And the, the animals who are part of the, uh, the Passover event, all of this, just one after another. It's like, you know, think of this. If, if, if I would have fallen into just one, it would have been amazing enough. But every, every other day or every other week or every other month, it was something new. And it was such a, an emotional experience for me because I look at myself, right, and I think of Paul's words that he said of himself. He said, who am I? I'm the chief of sinners, and I'm the least of all the saints. Mm -hmm. When I look in the mirror, that's who I see. I'm the least of all the saints, and I'm the chief of the sinners. Why would God choose me to be the vessel to show this to the world after 3,450 years? It makes no sense. So with some of these discoveries, I would just sit at my computer all alone in my house and tears would flow. Oh my. Once it was so intense that the fear of God also came on me at the time. And I told you at the dinner that the fear of God, I think, is a lost doctrine of the mm -hmm. church. Mm. Solomon says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord mm -hmm. and the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Yes. Where is our fear of God? Well, the fear of God came on me with one of those discoveries. I don't even remember now which one it was. But I was so overwhelmed. You know what I did? There was a low coffee table, and I went and plunged myself under the coffee table, put my hands over my head, and just wept. Oh my. Because I was so overcome by what God was doing mm -hmm. and that he would have me, the worst of all the instruments he could choose, to be the person to reveal it to the world. It made no sense. We, we've uh, had small little glimpses of things like that and just the research mm -hmm. that we've done because uh, we put out a couple of things that uh, either the Lord has shown us that, that are new or we're just way out in the field. <laughs> but your book, or Origins of the Hebrews, and your previous book, yes. um, the, the world's, uh, the oldest, world's alphabet. oldest alphabet, mm -hmm. you're really running counter to the mainstream of Egyptologists, the, the mainstream of uh, scholarship when it comes to ancient Egypt. There are some folks who don't like their ideas and their conclusions being challenged. I, uh, you know, I love me a good argument. I'm like the fellow in that old <laughs> comedy sketch who'd pay five bucks to have an argument. <laughs> oh no, this but, is abuse. <laughs> but, but, this is, but this is something else when you're talking about the word of God and, and the truth of it. So we, we can appreciate your, your approach to this mm -hmm. and, um, and, and really respect it but we also understand that you're probably in for a lot of criticism here. How did scholars react to the world's oldest alphabet? Well, it went over like a lead balloon. Oh. But no one yet has been able to disprove it. That's the bottom line. Here we are five years later, and no scholar has disproven the connection I make. The thesis of the book is that Hebrew is the language behind the world's oldest alphabetic script. Mm -hmm. So I've received criticism from Egyptologists, from biblical scholars, especially late Exodus advocates, because if I'm right, this, then their whole, their theory, whole right. system, they have to redo crumbled. all their graphs yeah. right. and all their charts. Yes, <laughs> so they can't agree with me on anything. But 
I, I go back to this, Derek, with all the opposition that has come, and there's come a lot, right? Even ad hominem arguments, personal attacks on me among the scholarly attacks. Mm. Um, I look at it this way. There's an old Arabian proverb that goes like this. The dogs only bark when the caravan is moving. <laughs> so if my caravan is moving, you'd better expect that there are dogs that are barking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I look at it this way, and I told you about this at, at dinner the other day. Look at the, the building of the walls under Nehemiah, right? For the, when the exiles came back from Babylonia, and they had to rebuild and, and make the city safe by building a wall. There was opposition that Nehemiah um, faced, wasn't there? And that opposition most squarely came from a man named Sanballat. Oh, yes. I look at it this way. I don't look at his, him as a negative. I look at him as a positive for Nehemiah and Zerubbabel. To be able to complete the work of the building of the wall, they needed Sanballat to oppose them because that's how God's name would be glorified the most and the best through the pain and the troubles and the tribulation that came from opposition. Well, you're saying something that Christians don't want to hear today. No. Don't tell me that I can't have everything and be happy. Mm -hmm. no. Don't tell me that I have to go through, you know, trials in order to, to be. I want to wake up tomorrow and be spiritually strong. Mm -hmm. You only get that by going through adversity. Right. And we are in a spiritual battle, aren't we? That's yes, what we are. That's what um, chapter 6 of Ephesians tells us. Mm -hmm. that, that our fight... Our struggle is not against mm -hmm. flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but it's against rulers and authorities and world powers who exist in the heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you know where the, one of the greatest areas where attack is coming for me personally? My most important relationships in life are being um, put in the crucible, right? And with, the, with an attempt from the enemy to destroy them. That is where the greatest and most painful opposition is coming in my mm. life. Mm. And it's, it's, there's a reason for this. I'm now on the enemy's hit list. I never intended to be, I would rather be in obscurity. I, believe it or not, I have a very um, not, what's, non outgoing personality. Uh, introverted. Introvert. Introverted, yeah. yeah. I have a very introverted so personality. Yeah. Right. You'd never know it, but I am. Yeah. But uh, I'd rather be off by myself, not bothering anyone and no one bothering me. We're, we're that way too. You know, a, a fun Friday night for us is finding a new paper on ancient Mesopotamian cosmology. Sure. Yeah. You know, it, it, sure. Just leave us alone at home. Mm -hmm. And when, when the lockdowns hit, we're like, oh, oh we have to stay rats, home. We have to be home. <laughs> right. This is terrible. So, but as you know, when you're doing work for the Lord and it's making a difference in the lives mm -hmm. of people, you'd better expect opposition because you will be on the enemy's radar. That and so that's true. where I am. I'm squarely in the enemy's radar. Because you're challenging one of the main assumptions of academia and one of the things that is being taught as a, uh, as a given to our children and our grandchildren, that the Bible is nothing but a collection of myths and fairy tales that were mm -hmm. invented to justify uh, the Jews mm -hmm. driving out the rightful owners mm -hmm. of the land. Well, and, especially uh, the Old Testament. Some people right, will throw yeah. that out and take the New Testament, but always pick and choose but, from right. that and say, oh, it's just sort of a, a lifestyle mm -hmm. recommendation. It, and, yes. and many of us don't know it, but our children and our grandchildren, when we send them off to colleges and university, you know what happens? They hear from professors there that you can't trust the reliability of the Bible. Exactly. And the strongest argument the, the front where it's, the attack has been the, the heaviest is the Bible says that the Israelites were in Egypt for, for 430 years, doesn't mm -hmm. it? But nobody has produced any evidence up until now to verify that's true. Mm -hmm. How can you trust the spiritual message in the Bible if you can't trust the historical record? Mm -hmm. And so in droves, our college students in churches across America and beyond are leaving the church because of this very thing. And when you say our college students, it's not just secular universities. Mm -hmm. Some Christian schools mm -hmm. are speaking in that way too. You're right, Sharon. Absolutely right. I wish I could name the schools I, even I'm now, but I won't. I'm not going to name any either, but there are certain, a lot of them, they're really becoming watered down mm -hmm. in their faith. Mm -hmm. And this idea of fearing the Lord. And, and if you're a young person and you're, you're thinking, what does she mean by fear the Lord? Am I supposed to be terrified of God? No, it's a respect. It's a sense of awe when you are in his presence and you feel the Holy Spirit all around you and you know he's talking to you and you realize that he is everything and you are simply his creation. 
and yet you are surrounded by his love. That is the most incredible feeling. And as you say, to know that he has come up to you and said, Doug, my son, hmm. I want to reveal this to you and only to you at this moment in time. And I want you to go out and tell the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. They will oppose you, mm -hmm. but I want you to tell it. Mm. That is, that's, that's sort of a trembling moment. For sure. Yeah. It's very humbling. Yeah. And well, we teased why... about the Hicksos. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that when we come back from the break. We want to tell you more about... Uh, the, the information in the book, uh, this is eye-opening, jaw-dropping, um, fire-starting, flame-throwing. <laughs> <laughs> Paradigm-shifting. Paradigm-shifting. Paradigm shifting. There we go. Origins of the Hebrews, the book by Dr. Doug Petrovich. Evidence of the Hebrews, evidence of Asiatics in Egypt. What's the difference? We'll talk about that when The Bible's Greatest Mysteries continues. Get the groundbreaking new book by Dr. Douglas Petrovich, Origins of the Hebrews, for your gift of $50 plus shipping and handling. Call toll-free 1-844-750-4985 or log on to skywatchtvstore.com. Call now and take advantage of Skywatch TV's most groundbreaking deal of the year with the rediscovery of the ancient prophecies from a mysterious group of prophets and scribes hundreds of years before Christ. Your understanding of end times prophecy and the final age of man is about to be forever changed. In Josh Peck's new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, the veil is lifted as you discover how much of what you've been taught about Israel in the first century is incomplete. Shockingly, there were Jewish believers who knew exactly what to expect from the coming Messiah, that he would be God in the flesh, would die for our sins, and even the date of his first arrival. In Josh Peck's new book, The Lost Prophecies of Qumran, you will discover lost prophecies only recently discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls about the time we are now living in, how the enigmatic group known as the Essenes formed and what influence they had on the New Testament, what hidden feasts and festivals the Essenes celebrated, and what messages the group left behind for believers living in the present age, how the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation fit within the Essene time timetable, and how an ancient Jewish calendar actually predicts the prophetic significance of the year 2025. But that's not all. For the first time ever, you'll also receive Dr. Ken Johnson's massive three-book collection entitled The Ancient Mysteries of the Essenes, where Dr. Johnson compiles three of his most groundbreaking research studies on the Dead Sea Scrolls into one massive collection. In Book 1, The Ancient Dead Sea Scrolls Calendar and the Prophecies It Reveals, you will discover the secrets of the mysterious 364-day calendar used by the ancients since the time of creation and how it has been hidden until now for the appointed time. In Book 2, Ancient Testimonies of the Patriarchs, Autobiographies from the Dead Sea Scrolls, you will hear the previously hidden prophetic texts of such patriarchs as Enos, grandson of Adam, Lamech, father of Noah, Amram, father of Moses and Aaron, and even Enoch from the Book of Enoch fame. And in the most shocking revelation yet, Book 3, The Ancient Order of Melchizedek, you will learn astonishing facts about the enigmatic priest Melchizedek, such as why his priesthood was and is different from that of Levi, why the Messiah was ordained after the order of Melchizedek, and how the facts surrounding this mysterious order dramatically affect the theology and practical applications of our Christian walk today. This collection is an absolute necessity for any researcher's library, and for those who want to fully step into the minds of the ancients and see the Dead Sea Scrolls like they never have before. Now you can get this incredible collection for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling. So don't miss out on Skywatch TV's most groundbreaking deal of the year, The Lost Prophecies and Ancient Mysteries Collection. Available now at skywatchtvstore.com. Order now or call 1-844-750-4985. Welcome back to The Bible's Greatest Mysteries from Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and we're having such a good conversation with Dr. Doug Petrovich. If you want a book in your library that you are going to refer to at just as you talk with your kids and grandkids or with your friends or a Bible study, this is the book. But also, this is a great book for your college students, yep. for your high school students. 
encourage the young people in your family, in your sphere of influence, to not only learn about the truth of the Bible, but also to prepare to be an archaeologist. Because and we're going to talk about that a whole oh, lot yeah, in the next yeah. program. But we need more Christians in archaeology. We do, we do. Mm -hmm. And more Christians who are willing to work in uh, Israel and in the Levant, where mm -hmm. uh, so much of that history took place. Um, so, Hyksos. The Hyksos. Uh, this was something I found really interesting. I, I've kind of had to uh, educate myself on this. As we started researching this about five years ago, we, we produce a weekly Bible study online, and we got to Exodus 14 and noticed for the first time as we were reading it out loud, God told, said to Moses, tell the Israelites, turn back. Like, wait a minute, I don't remember Charlton Heston making a U-turn in the movie. But he did. And so that Can you imagine this... being the last person in line and the word comes down to everybody <laughs> turning around <laughs> and heading back toward them? No. What? <laughs> Moisha said, what? <laughs> <laughs> we, but the evidence has been there for a, a Semitic presence. The Asiatics that you mentioned previously, uh, the team from Austria working at Avaris has documented this. Um, presumably, the Israelites, the Hebrews, were among that group. What's the difference between the Asiatics and the Hebrews? And then where do the Hyksos come into play? Mm -hmm. There were Asiatics who settled at Avaris mm -hmm. before the Hyksos ever arrived. And history tells us it's around 1668 B.C. that the Hyksos arrived. Now, when you say Asiatics, can you sort of give us a modern-day sure. map and tell sure. us who those are? So um, the scholars use this term Asiatics to refer to basically any people group that's uh, um, not in Africa, but that's in Asia including uh, Asia Minor that we know as modern Turkey. Turkey. So in any of that region and to the east, gotcha. that's all Asia. And so any of those peoples can be Asiatics. So there's a certain people group that settles there who are Asiatic, um, from Asia and not from, from uh, Africa, who settle at Avaris in um, the 12th dynasty in the, in the um, 1800s BC. And we spoke about that before. And I've these are the ones I'm connecting to Hebrews. There's another people group, distinct people group, that settles in Egypt, and their hub becomes the same hub as the Israelites, and that is Avaris. So they settle there in roughly 1668 B.C. Ar archaeologically, we can demonstrate that they arrive at that point. There are differences culturally in their tools, in their weapons, in their pottery, and in other daily items that they use. So it's about 200 years after Joseph yes. and then Jacob arrive. And, yes. yeah, and so about 200 years in, and mm -hmm. 200 years where things are going great is there are the wine merchants of uh, Africa. Right. Right. Uh, then these Hyksos arrive yes. and set up shop. And most scholars think that the Hyksos derived ultimately from the Caucasus, from the area of the mm -hmm. Caucasus, much to the north and east. Oh. Um, That's interesting. That they would have moved down from there to the potentially to the Levant and then sp you know springboarded into mm -hmm. Egypt. So Hurrians, basically. Well, Scythians. Um, even Hurrians? even further to the east and to the north okay. than the Hurrians. Okay. But they would have settled then um, with Avaris as their hub, and they would have essentially moved next door, if you will, to the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And they apparently got along well because there's no sign of any conflict between them. But then all of a sudden, at the, um, at the time of the 17th dynasty of Egypt, and that is a uh, native Egyptian dynasty that exists in the south, in upper Egypt. And remember that Egypt, it's kind of like backwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, southern Egypt is higher in elevation. And as the Nile flows, it flows to the north into the Mediterranean Sea. Right. So the 17th dynasty was in power, and they were constantly trying to push further to the north because the Hyksos in the north had been pushing to the south to gain more and more control, and they wanted to overpower the native Egyptians there, but they never did. And the native Egyptians eventually fought back enough over decades of warfare, um, with Kamosa being um, th the main um, pharaoh of the 17th dynasty who made that thrust, that push to the north, and then Amosa, his brother, finished the job. So Amosa is the final pharaoh of dynasty 17, and he becomes the first king of dynasty 18, when he defeats, he pushed, pushed the, the uh, Hyksos all the way back to their, to their headquarters at Avaris, and then he overtook the city. The survivors fled to the Levant, and they holed up, that's H-O-L-E-D, they mm -hmm. holed up mm -hmm. at a site called Sharu Hen, and they sat there and just kind of um, tried to you know, regroup. Well, the Egyptians, of course, now the native Egyptians, and think of this, this is after decades of warfare to, to regain control of the delta, which is a rich area. Mm -hmm. You need to control it to, to really be able to have power in Egypt. So 
Now they finally have control. Amosa looks around and he says, okay, our, our, our military is decimated. Our enemy is dead and defeated except the ones who went over to Sharuhan in the Levant. What should we do? And, and they looked around and they said, oh, well, we also have this problem of the Israelites. In fact, they're so numerous that they outnumber us. Oh. Here's what we need to do. We need to make sure that they don't, with their manpower, they don't join themselves to our enemies at, in Sharuhan. Because if they do, then they'll come back and attack us and surely they'll wipe us all out because we're so small now. Sure. We're outnumbered and they will have the military uh, genius of, of the surviving Hyksos. So it's at, at that point that that Pharaoh, this is the Pharaoh who did not know of Joseph, not know right. him because personally. Because he was in the south. Because he was in the south. Right. Oh. All of the kings in the north, all the way from Joseph's day until this point, they knew exactly who Joseph was. Mm -hmm. They knew. Mm -hmm. The Hyksos even knew. But these people, they didn't know who Joseph was because they were physically removed. So in the for same way that we time. know 200 years later who Thomas Jefferson was and right. James Madison mm -hmm. and yes. uh, Abraham Lincoln and so forth, they would have remembered Joseph and they had the statue there at Avaris to Jacob. Yes, the, the but monument. if the right things are going with certain groups well, of people erasing history, <laughs> yeah. there will come a day when, who are They'll those They'll be treated people? like Hatshepsut, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So the, uh, the Hyksos then were, were driven out, this new uh, Amosa, mm -hmm. who uh, say uh, the, the middle of the 16th century BC, or 1560, 1550 mm -hmm. BC, mm -hmm. uh, a little before the time of Moses' birth, mm -hmm. he says, we're afraid these people will align with our enemies and so we need to oppress them. And so that about halfway through the sojourn in Egypt is when things get bad for the Israelites. Yeah, it's essentially 114 years of slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's not in opposition to the Bible at all. I, I think we commonly think that the Israelites were, were, were enslaved for that entire time. That's not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm, no. And in, in Genesis 15, 13, it's often mistranslated, poorly translated. Even some of our best, you know, long-standing trusted translations are not precise on this. Because that's describing that um, in, a, in a period of roughly 400 years, that, that the descendants of Abram will be foreigners and that they will be in a land not their own and they will be oppressed. Mm -hmm. All those things will happen over roughly 400 years. But it's not saying that there was 400 years of slavery. Ah. It's all of those things as a package deal. Right. That's roughly 400 years. And then uh, Exodus 12, 40 and, 42, uh, 40 and 41 make it clear that it's precisely 430 years, which well represents that, that um, prophetic... Um, utterance that God gave to Abram, suggesting that it would be around 430, 400 years, and now mm -hmm. we know it's 430. Wow. So the, uh, the political situation changes. Moses arrives. Hatshepsut saves Moses <laughs> from the river. So the, the, the practice then of killing all the, uh, the young male babies among the Hebrews was uh, a genocide. Let's, let's wipe out these people so they don't... Uh, we, we destroy their numbers so they cannot become a military force that will threaten us again? Yeah, certainly that's part of it. Um, and yeah, it's all part of this, uh, this sense that the Egyptians have that these, these Asiatic people are a threat mm -hmm. to us. And if we, if we can limit their numbers, if we can keep them under control, then we can sustain ourselves and, and not have to fear that they will, they will overtake us. Oh, sure. Uh, the Hyksos, w w is there a connection between them and the Amorites, or the, is, is there debate among scholars? W where do, because I, I had assumed that the Hyksos, based on their names, were Semitic-speaking people like the Amorites. Yeah, they, they could have a connection to the, to the Amorites. I don't know if that's been proven or not. We, we, we don't know as much about them as we would like. Uh, we're learning more all the time. But yeah, the, it's a dispute as to their, their point of origin. So... Um, you know, that's an unsolved mystery that we're kind of waiting to see what happens. But certainly um, they are an ancient Near Eastern people that's Asiatic and that um, has more in commonality with the Hebrews than the Egyptians do. <laughs> where, where did the word Hebrew come from? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, eventually I'm going to publish on a connection between the Habiru ah. and the Hebrews. Who are the Habiru? Well, I think we can start with the Bible. Uh, if you look at the genealogy in Genesis 10, there's a, a, a predecessor of Abraham, if you go back enough generations. His name is Abair. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, yes. Abair almost certainly 
is the person who is, you know, it, it's after him that we, we, we get this name Habiru and the word Hebrew. The Bible, when, when Moses introduces Abram um, for the first time, he says that Abram is of what nationality? Hebrew. A, a Hebrew. Mm -hmm. he, yes. says, he says that he is a Hebrew. Yes. That means Abram is not the first of w what he is. Mm -hmm. that, right. that this is right. a family that goes back. Right. It goes back to Abar. Abar is the name that, that they're named after. Why Abar? Because he had a son named Peleg. Mm -hmm. And in Peleg's day, the Bible says there was a division on the earth. Mm -hmm. yes. That is the post -ba that is the, the, the Babylonian um, right. the fiasco. Mm -hmm. right? And the post-Babylonian -ba post uh, or post babel dispersion. So that being the case, in, in the days of, of Peleg, his father is alive. So it's after him that these race of people are named who, who God gives, whom God gives, a, a distinct language. So all of those people under the umbrella of, of, of Eber, who in Semitic languages can be called Heber, if you like. Mm -hmm. So Heber or Eber, um, has all of these descendants, and they go, they sprout off into different directions, and the biblical Hebrews are only one of them. They're they're found in in Mesopotamian writings in other parts of Mesopotamia throughout the end of the third millennium BC and the beginning of the second millennium BC. In in Egypt, these people are called um, um, the the Apiru. They're called the Apiru. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the Apiru yes. are the same as the Habiru, and. The Amarna letters, for example, of um, the 1300s, the early 1300s BC, the early part of the 14th century BC, that mention um, Habiru people in Canaan attacking the the, the petty kings of the city states right, right, in Canaan. Right, right. Mm -hmm. They're attacking them. These these people are attacking them. Even the greatest city in all of um, all of Canaan is is Chatzor, where I did I was mm -hmm. part of the excavation mm -hmm. there. Oh. I'm going to have to stop you there okay. because we're running out of time, but right. we'll take that up next week. Okay, I oh, promise. Yes. I promise. We are really talking about the origins of the Hebrews, not just the people, but also the name. But, uh, next week, we will continue the discussion and uh, pose some additional questions uh, that we didn't prepare you for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as we continue investigating the Bible's greatest mysteries.